This beginner's course will help you learn the fundamentals of programming with Visual Basic .NET. Visual Basic is an object-oriented programming language developed by Microsoft. It's often used to make desktop apps for Windows, but you can use the programming language for a wide variety of applications, and not just on Windows. Kevin Drum teaches this course. Kevin is the head of computer science at a school in the UK. Kevin will teach you everything from getting Visual Studio set up for programming to understanding the basic constructs of high-level programming languages. This is an excellent course for anyone who wants to learn Visual Basic. Leave a comment with the most interesting thing you learned in this course. In this series of videos, I'm going to introduce you to programming with Visual Basic .NET inside Visual Studio. So let's begin by launching Visual Studio and taking a look at some of the features. Exactly what you see here will depend on which version of Visual Studio you're using. You can see that I'm using Visual Studio 2019. But essentially the features will be the same. You can see I have a list of my most recently used projects on the left hand side. On the right I'm going to choose the option to create a new project. And again what you see next will depend on which version of Visual Studio you're using. It will also depend on which programming languages you installed. You can see that I've installed a number of different programming languages, which tells you Visual Studio itself is not a programming language, it's an environment in which you can use a programming language. I'm going to use Visual Basic. On the right hand side, I can see a number of different project templates which I can choose from. and I'm going to create a Windows Forms app. So, with the correct option chosen, click Next. You're now invited to give the project a name. It's offering me the name Windows App 2. This is because it's the second application which I've created. It's not a very meaningful name, so I strongly recommend that you change that. Perhaps, perhaps not, I think that's been done before. That'll do for now. You also need to be mindful of where the project will be saved, the location of your project. You can see the location of mine will be D Visual Studio 2019 projects, but you can change this. In fact, I'll show you later that once you're in Visual Studio, you can change the default location. This is particularly important if you're working in a school or a college or an organization. It may be that you only have permission to save Visual Studio projects in particular locations. Notice there's a browse button here if you do want to change the location. My solution has the same name as the project. I'll say a little bit about the difference between a solution and a project in a moment. And I'm going to say that I want to place the solution and the project in the same directory by ticking this box. Since this is a brand new project, I'm not going to worry too much about which version of the .NET framework I'm using. More about that later as well. So let's hit Create. And here is Visual Studio. I can see a little message on the bottom right there telling me that there's a new version of Visual Studio which can be downloaded. I'll maybe do that a little bit later. I'll just ignore it for now. Now there are lots of options here which I'll be talking about as we go along but suffice to say for now we have a menu of options across the top and each of these has a number of sub options which in turn might have a number of sub options. There's a toolbar. I can add extra toolbars which you'll see later but the most useful one is here to start with. On the right hand side I can see my solution explorer a solution is a collection of files that make up my application. And we'll take a closer look at these files later. I have a properties window, which will become important when I start building my user interface. And on the left hand side, there's a toolbox. If I just click on this, it will move into view. If I click away from it, it disappears. I actually like the toolbox in place all the time. So I'm going to click on this little drawing pin to keep it there. And I can resize it if I need to. 
In the middle, I've got my form. This is where I'm going to start building my user interface. So let's write some code. I'm going to start by dropping a button onto the form. So from my toolbox, I click on button, draw the button onto the form. Because the button is selected, I can see properties of the button in the properties window on the right hand side. I can see, for example, we have the text property of the button, which is currently button one. I'm going to change that to press here and notice how it's changed the appearance of the button on the form. The other thing I want to change is the name of the button. Every object that you place on a form will have a name property. Now it's currently button one because it's the first button which I placed on the form and I could leave it as button one, but I want to start using a naming convention. BTN in lowercase because it's a button and then something meaningful which tells me what the button does. For example, start. You could call the button pretty much anything you like, as long as the name doesn't start with a number and as long as there are no spaces or special characters like question marks or exclamation marks in there. This naming convention makes it clear what the button does and it also makes it clear that it's a button and that will become important later on when I start writing code. There are other properties which I can change as well, for example, the background colour. And I have a colour palette here which I can use. We'll stick with this for now, but you'll learn about other properties as and when you need them. What I want to do now is write some code that will run when the user of my application clicks on the button. To write some code for the button, I can double click it. The way to think of this is that the code is behind the form. My form is still there. You can see there's a tab here. That's the design view of my form and this is the visual basic view of my form. Notice that the toolbox no longer has anything on it because it's inappropriate to use it while I'm coding. I have line numbers down the left hand side. To be honest, I don't like these and I'll turn them off in a moment. And I can see some code already there and I have to be very careful not to break it. For example, I can see public class form one at the top and end class at the bottom. I'm not going to change this. These need to be in place in order for the form to work. Later, when you find out more about object oriented programming, these two lines will make more sense. I can also see the stub of a procedure which will run when the button is clicked. Private sub button start click. Notice that's the name that I gave to my button. And notice that it's going to handle the click of the button. To be more precise, it will handle the click event of the button object. There's also some stuff going on in brackets here. These are called parameters and you'll find out more about parameters later. Suffice to say, leave this exactly as it is for now. We're going to write code between sub and end sub. So I'm just going to press the enter key a few times and give myself some more room. I can also give myself some more room above the procedure and below the procedure. Sub, by the way, stands for sub procedure. So let's write our first program. I'm going to use the message box command. Notice I'm typing in lowercase and as I type, a list of options has appeared. Visual Studio is looking at the letters I'm typing and offering me a command to choose from. So I can see MSG box here. I can ignore it and carry on typing or I can actually select it from the list. I'll show you how we can do this more quickly in a moment. I'll just press the space bar and I'm going to open a bracket. And again, there's some more information appearing on the screen. It's quite daunting the first time you see this, but as you get used to it, you'll find it's incredibly useful. Again, I'm just going to ignore it. 
Notice how Visual Studio has automatically put the closing bracket on there for me. I'm going to open a double quote. And again, Visual Studio has automatically put the closing double quote on there. And finally, I'll type the text of my message. Hello world. All kinds of things have happened here. For example, notice that MSG box has automatically recapitalized. That tells me that I typed it correctly. I'm getting visual feedback. Notice also the color coding. The literal string, which I'm using in my text message, is colored differently from the command itself. Again, I'm getting visual feedback on how to use this. This is why it's called Visual Studio. Let's put another message in. Now I've just typed the first few letters this time and I'm going to press the tab key on my keyboard to select the rest of it. I've saved myself some typing. When you get used to it, you can write code very, very quickly. Hello world, how are you? And one more. Spelling mistake there. I'm just going to hold down my control key and tap the left arrow key, which will jump me one word at a time through that text. And then I can correct my spelling. To be honest, it doesn't matter what I put inside these double quotes. It won't be a problem. If, on the other hand, I mistype the command, I see a red wiggly line underneath it telling me that I've made an error. This is what we call a syntax error. I'm breaking the rules of the programming language. If I move my mouse over it, I can see some kind of error message there. MSGG box is not declared. Visual Studio thinks I'm trying to use something called a variable, and I haven't announced that I want to use it. More about variables later on. Let's just get rid of this line altogether. OK, so there's my program. I'll just close up a little bit of the white space. I don't need it. And I'm going to run the code. There's a Start button at the top. And my form is now on the screen. And to test it, I'll simply click on the button. There's my first message. There's my second message. And there's my third message and the program has stopped running. My procedure may have stopped running, but the application itself is still running. The form is still on the screen, and I can stop this running by pressing the red square up here, or I can simply close the form with the red cross here. And everything has stopped. So there we have it, our first program, which is just a sequence of messages, but it's a program. There's one more thing I want to do now, and that is to save my work. Remember, a Visual Studio application can consist of several files, so rather than just clicking this little button here, which will save the form, I'm going to click this button, which will save all of the files in my application. I can now close down Visual Studio and return to my application tomorrow. In this video, I just want to show you how we can customize the integrated development environment, the IDE, that is Visual Studio. So let's start it up again. And I'm going to open up the project that I was working on last time. Notice that it's in the recent files list, so I could just click on it here. Alternatively, I can click on open a project or solution. Let's do it this way for now, so we can see which file we need to open up. Here's my D drive. This is where I'm storing my projects. And here's the one I was working on last time. Notice it's a folder. Inside that folder, there's a solution file, SLN. That's the file which ties together all of the other files that make up my application. That's the file which I need to open. And here's the application I was working on last time. Here's my form. And here's the code behind it. 
A little word of warning first of all, sometimes you might accidentally double click on the background of the form itself. Watch what happens when I do this. I've got another procedure stub here called Form 1 Load. Any code which I write in here will automatically run when I run up the application, which will cause the form to load. But I don't need this, so I'm going to get rid of it. I'm simply going to delete this procedure stub. Another word of warning, you might accidentally, or even deliberately, click on this, where it says One Reference. Let's take a look. I've clicked on that, something has appeared, and I'm going to click on this as well. I have another tab across the top, and what I can see here looks very complicated indeed. This is code which runs when you run the form, but you don't really need to see it if you're a beginner. In fact, it's quite daunting when you look at it. Suffice to say for now, it's actually initialising the form. It's setting up the form, and it's placing the button on there, and it's changing various properties of the button. I strongly recommend you leave this alone until you have a better understanding of what it does. I'm just going to close down this tab. And I'm back to something more familiar. Anyway, what I want to talk about now is how we can customise this programming environment. You were given some options when you ran it up for the first time, but you can change those options inside Tools, Options. Notice I'm using a colour theme, blue, but you can change it to dark if you wish. Some people much prefer this. To be honest, I don't. I prefer black on white, not white on black. It really is a matter of preference. I'm going to switch it back to the way it was. I can also have finer control over the keyword colours and over the text colours, and any other colours that you see on here for that matter. We can do this by selecting Fonts and Colours. You can see there's a lot of options here. Keyword, the default colour is blue, and I can switch that to magenta. You do need to be a little bit careful though, because some colours have special meanings, and it can start looking very messy as well. If needs be, you can change things back. Notice there's an option here to use defaults. Some people like to increase the font size as well. It's entirely up to you. Something else I want to change to give myself some more room on the screen is to switch off these line numbers. I can do that by going to Text Editor, All Languages, and then here, Line Numbers. Notice I can have different configurations depending on the programming language I'm using. And there's one more thing I want to change, and that's some of the default file locations. I can do that underneath Projects and Solutions, Locations. You can see I've already set my Projects location to my D drive. Needless to say, there are lots more options which you can set in here, and I'll be honest, I don't know what half of them are, but when I need them, I'll find them. Click OK for your changes to take effect. In this video about Visual Basic.net, I want to say more about output, and I'm going to introduce you to variables. I'll start by creating a new project. As before, it'll be a Windows Forms application in Visual Basic. Give the project a meaningful name and think about where it's going to be saved. You can change this if necessary. Let's start with a button on the form 
and I'm going to rename the button. Get in the habit of renaming things that you place on the form as you go along. BTN, that's my convention, and then go. This is called camel notation because of the capital G. It looks like a camel with a hump on its back. I'm also going to change the text property of the button. And let's write some code that will run when the user clicks on the button. To get to the code behind the form, I double click the button. And let me just remind you, you mustn't change or delete this. If you do, you'll start seeing errors on the screen. Watch. Straight away, I've got a syntax error up here. Class statement must end with matching end class. I'll just use the undo button to put it back again. And I'm going to give myself some white space, just give myself a bit more room on the screen here. And we've already seen that we can display a message on the screen using the message box command like this. To test it, I simply press the start button. That will run the form up, and then I can run my code by clicking on the button itself. Now, there are three fundamental constructs when it comes to programming that I'd like to mention now. The first of these is sequence. The second is selection, which you'll see in a later video. And the third is iteration, which you'll also see in a later video. For now, let's just say a little bit about sequence. Sequence simply means that each statement in a program or a block of code will run one after another in sequence. So, for example, I could display each of these words separately. Run the program, press the button, and one message after another. And I'll stop my application with this red square. If I want to display these words in reverse order, I can simply change the order of the commands. I'm just dragging and dropping. and tidy up some of the white space. You can have as much or as little white space as you like, whatever makes it easy for you to read the program. Let's give this a try. Before I continue and talk about variables, I just want to show you another command I can use to display a message on the screen. Message box dot show. Let's take a look. This is another message. It does exactly the same thing. To be honest, this is a bit of an old style command which has existed from very early versions of Visual Basic. This is a more modern way of doing things. This is an object-oriented approach. And it'll make more sense why you might do it this way later when you find out more about object-oriented programming. For now, you can either use msgbox or messagebox.show. I'm going to continue with msgbox. So now let's talk about variables. I'll start by placing another button on the form because I want to write a separate procedure. Switch to the form and drop another button on there. Notice I'm getting some guidelines as I drag the button around and resize it. This helps me to create a nice layout for my form. OK, let's get in the good habits of naming objects as we go along. So I'm going to call this BTN variables. And I'll change the text property as well. 
to write the code as before, double click, and you can see I now have a new procedure stub. I can start writing my code here. Let's give myself a little bit more white space below and a little bit less at the top here. So what is a variable? Well, a variable is actually a location in the computer's memory where a program can temporarily store data while it's running. And while that sounds a little bit complicated, they're actually very easy to set up and use. Let's say, for example, I want to create a variable to store somebody's first name. The first thing I need to do is declare it. I need to announce that I want to use a new variable. And I do this using the dim statement, like this. Now, there are a number of things going on in this command. First of all, the word dim is short for dimension, because I'm actually setting aside a certain amount of memory. I'm specifying the size or the dimension of the variable. The amount of memory being set aside depends on this, which is the data type of the variable. When it comes to string variables, one byte of memory will be needed for each character in the string. But to be honest, I don't need to worry too much about that. Visual Basic will look after the memory for me. Or to be more precise, the runtime engine that Visual Basic depends on will take care of the memory for me. The other thing I'm doing is I'm giving my variable a name. And again, notice that I'm using camel notation and I've prefixed it with st because it's a string variable. That's just a convention which I'm going to encourage you to use. You might want to know what data type a variable is just by glancing at its name. So that's my variable declaration. I've got a green wavy line underneath it to tell me that I haven't done anything with it yet. Unused local variable. So let's now assign a value to it. Notice I'm typing in lowercase. I'm being offered the name of the variable in a list, so I'll just press the tab key to select it. And I'll say st first name is equal to my first name. Notice that the green wavy line has disappeared now because I'm using the variable. In earlier versions of Visual Basic, you would have to use the let command in front of this. You'd say let st first name equal Kevin, let it become Kevin. In this version of Visual Basic, we don't use let at all. But what you need to appreciate here is I'm putting the string Kevin into that piece of memory, which I set aside. Because the string is one, two, three, four, five characters long, it's going to take up five bytes of memory. As I said before, though, you don't really need to worry too much about that. OK, now I'm going to output the contents of that variable, and I'll do that using message box. Notice that I haven't put double quotes around the name of the variable, because I want to output its contents. I don't literally want to output the string st first name. Let's see what happens. I'm outputting the contents of the variable. I want to make the message a little bit more friendly. So I'm going to join the contents of the variable with some literal text, like this. You can see that this is a literal string because it's inside double quotes. And this is the contents of my variable. And I'm using the concatenation operator, which is an ampersand, to join the two together. We call this string concatenation. I can concatenate something onto the end of it as well. Again, another concatenation operator. Let's see the effect. Hello and welcome, Kevin. I hope you are well. I want you to notice that I put spaces inside these text strings. Notice there's a space after the letter E. Let's just remove it for a second and see what happens. I've also got a space there inside the string immediately before the I. 
I'll just take that out as well. Look what happens. You can see the message is a little bit messy. Let's tidy it up. OK, I'm going to declare another variable to hold my last name. So another dim statement. And I'll assign a value to this variable as well. And I'll include the last name as part of the message. A common mistake is to not use enough ampersands. Watch what happens if I get rid of this one. You can see I have a syntax error. The message isn't particularly helpful, but I know that there's something wrong with the way I've concatenated this string together. So let's put the concatenation operator back in place. Another common mistake is not to use enough double quotes. So again, I'll take out one of those double quotes. And you can see that the whole thing seems to be a problem. One little error, and I've got red wavy lines all over the place. This is not particularly helpful. Just remember, double quotes and brackets come in pairs. If you have an opening double quote, there has to be a matching closing double quote. If you have an opening bracket, there has to be a matching closing bracket. Let's try this. Now you can see Kevin Drum has come out as one word. There's no space in between the two. I can fix this easily. I need to concatenate a space in between those two variables. A space is just another character. Let's take a look. Much better. Notice that I've put my dim statements, my variable declarations, at the top of the procedure. I didn't have to do this. As long as I declare a variable, before I try to assign a value to it, I can put my dim statement wherever I like. So for example, I could declare the last name here and then assign a value to it. That's absolutely fine. What I mustn't do is try to assign a value to it before I declare it. You can see I have a syntax error. Local variable st last name cannot be used before it has been declared. The sequence of operations is important. Although what you can see here is perfectly OK, I like to put all of my declarations at the top of the procedure. Keep them all together. It actually makes the code easier to manage, particularly when you have a lot of code. I told you that a variable was a temporary storage location which your program can use while it's running. When this program has done its job and it comes to an end, the memory being used by the variables will be released. It'll be freed up for something else to use. But I can change the contents of a variable while the program is running. That's why it's called a variable. Its contents can vary. So for example, I can do this. I'm just going to copy these two lines of code, paste them underneath. They're still part of the procedure. And I'm assigning new values to those variables, which I'll output in the same way as I did before. I can just borrow this line of code and copy it. So watch what happens when I run the program. Hello and welcome Kevin Drum. I hope you are well. Hello and welcome Mervyn Drake. I hope you are well. This makes the point that the contents of a variable can change while the program is running. I can assign different values to those variables at runtime. In the next video, I'll say more about the different data types that you can use when you declare a variable and what implications this has for your code. In this video, I want to say more about different variable data types. I'm going to store some details about a car. Let's start with a new button on the form. Give it a name. 
and change the text property. Double clicking will allow me to write the code. OK, so I'm going to start with a couple of string variables to store the make and the model. We've come across string variables already. Let's assign some values. A Ford Escort, a classic car. I also want to store the number of doors that this car has. This time I'm using a data type of integer. An integer is just another name for a whole number. Notice the naming convention I'm using, i doors, i for integer. I want to store the colour of the car. This is going to be another string variable. I want to store some information about whether or not this car has been taxed. This time I'm using a data type of Boolean, named after the computer scientist George Boole. A Boolean variable can have one of two values, true or false. This car has been taxed. Boolean variables are good when you have yes-no type data, for example whether somebody is a vegetarian or not, whether something is switched on or something is switched off. I also want to store the engine size. Another integer. 1200 cc. I'd like to store the price of this car. I'm using a data type of decimal. Decimal is the most suitable data type when you want to store money values. I could have used double and I could have used single because all three data types, decimal, double, single, allow me to have a decimal point with decimal places after it. But double is twice as accurate as single. I can have more decimal places. And the data type decimal is the most accurate of them all, which makes sense when you're doing calculations with money. The final thing I want to store is the date that the car was registered, so I'm going to use a data type of date. There's a special way that I have to assign a value to a date variable. Notice I'm using the hash symbols to enclose the date. I should also point out that this is not the 11th of February, but the 2nd of November. When you type a date, you need to type it in American format, which is the month followed by the day followed by the year. When I display this on the screen, for example in a message box, it'll be displayed according to the settings in my computer's control panel. You'll see in a moment that my computer is set up to display dates in British format. Now let's build a message box command to display all of this data. Notice the concatenation operators between the variable names, and notice also that I'm concatenating spaces between these data items. Now you can see I have a bit of a problem here with reading the code I've written on the screen. Nevertheless, let's test it and see if it runs. There's my message, and it looks OK. Notice that the day and the month of the date are the other way round from the way I coded it. I've written the date in American format, but it's being displayed in British format. What I'd really like to be able to do is display each data item on a separate line within the same message box. Let's see how to do that. Instead of concatenating spaces in between each data item, 
I'm going to type a special constant. I'll say more about constants later. Suffice to say, I'm just going to type VB new line. And I'll replace each space with this. Let's just copy and paste it. Control C to copy, Control V to paste. I still need the same number of concatenation operators to join all these different bits and pieces together. Let's see how it looks now. Well, that is certainly a nicer message. But now I want to do something about the problem that I can't actually read the whole line of code. I could give myself some more space on the screen by just dragging this bar across a little bit, but even then I can't read the whole line of code. I essentially want to wrap this text on the screen. Well, I can do this. After the ampersand here, in fact I can put this pretty much anywhere, I'm just going to leave a space and then type an underscore character. When I press enter, I've moved the rest of the line onto the next line down. I can do that again here. Notice the underscore characters have actually disappeared. But this is still just one line of code. It won't change the appearance of the message box, but it just allows me to read the code more easily on the screen. Let's make sure it still works. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. In the next video, I'll show you how we can capture input from the user of an application so we can assign the contents of these variables at runtime rather than hard coding the data like we've done here. I want to show you how to capture input from the user of your application and I'll be doing it by means of this form. And you'll also see how to use some of these extra controls that we can place onto a form. Before I do, let me just show you a quick and easy way we can capture input from the user by means of the input box function. I'll drop a button on the form first, give it a name, and a text property. Double click to write the code. The input box function will capture one piece of data. Specifically, it'll capture a string. I'll need a variable to put that piece of data into, so let's declare a string variable first of all. And then I can assign a value to it by means of the input box function, just like this. And to prove it works, I'll output the contents of that variable. I'm concatenating the word hello in front of it. Let's give it a try. Press the button to launch the procedure. And there's the input box prompt. Please enter your first name. And that's working fine. So it's a quick and easy way to prompt the user for some input. But what I really want to talk about in this video is how we can use controls on the form to capture input. So I'm going to delete the code you can see here and do something else instead. Let's go back to the form. I'm going to place a text box on the form. Here it is in the control toolbox. I'll give the text box a name. Notice at the moment it's called text box one. I've prefixed the new name with txt to indicate that it's a text box and then I'm calling it first name because that's the data I want to capture. I'm trying to keep the name meaningful. Notice the camel notation as well. You'll see the benefit of doing it this way in a few moments. I'm also going to put a label on the form so that the user of the form knows what to type into the text box. Here's the label control. And again, I'm going to change its name to keep it meaningful. LBL for a label, and then something to indicate its purpose. A label also has a text property, which I'm going to change. 
and you can see that is what appears on the form. While I'm at it, I'm going to add another text box to capture the user's last name. And a matching label. And one more text box to capture the user's gender. Notice that a text box also has a text property, but anything I type in here will actually appear in the text box. It will become the default data if a user doesn't type something into the text box. I'm going to leave it blank. And we'll have another matching label to go with this text box. There are a couple of things you need to be aware of when you're placing controls on the form. Each control must have a unique name. So this one, you can see I called it TXT First Name. There's the name property. And this one I called TXT Last Name. Let me just make the mistake of giving this text box the same name as the other one and see what happens. Property value is not valid. Take a look at the details and it's telling me that the name is already in use by another component. Something else on the form has already been called TXT first name. If this happens, just cancel and find out which one is the offending control. Something else I should mention is you can't have spaces in a control name. So let's put a space in this text box name. Again, an error message. And maybe I'll even try putting a question mark on the end of the name. Another error message. So there are some limitations as to what you can call a text box or indeed any other control on the form. The text property, on the other hand, of a label or a button can be pretty much anything you like. OK, let's just tidy up the layout a little bit. I'm watching the guidelines for assistance. And you can also use the format menu to help you control the layout of a form. See, I have options for alignment, horizontal and vertical spacing. This one is particularly handy. If I select all of these text boxes, I can say I want to make them all the same width, for example, and I can make them all the same height. If I want to move things around as a group, I just draw a box around them to highlight them and I can drag them to a new position. You can play around with the various tools available to improve the cosmetic appearance of your form when you have time. But for now, I just want to show you how we can capture some data. So let's write the code for the button. I'm going to start by declaring three variables into which I'm going to load the data that I capture. I'm using a standard naming convention again, ST because these are string variables, and then of course something meaningful in camel notation. I've just spotted a spelling mistake as well, let's fix this. Now I'm going to take the information that the user types onto the form and load it into these variables. Starting with the first name. ST first name equals a single equal sign means I'm about to assign something to this variable. And the information I want is on the form in a text box called TXT first name. I've just typed the first three characters of the text box name TXT and I'm being presented with a list of the text boxes on the form. You can see why I use this naming convention. As long as I make sure that all of my text boxes begin with TXT, I'll get a nice little list of them. So I'll select TXT first name and I want to take the text property, in other words the text that the user typed into that text box and I'm going to load that into my variable. So this reads as take the text from the text box called TXT first name and assign it to that variable. 
Let's do the same with the other variables. And finally, I'm going to output the data in a message box just to make sure it worked. I've included a space between the first name and the last name. And I've concatenated some extra text in my message as well. Let's see what happens when we run it then. Type in some information. And there's the output from my procedure. If I dismiss the message box, the application is still running, so I can change the data here. The program is assigning new values to those variables, overwriting the existing ones. One more time. So there you have it, capturing data from a user by means of text boxes on a form. Let's quickly take a look at another control which I can use on a form. I want to show you a list box. And I'm going to use this to capture the user's occupation. So let's give it a name. LST occupation. LST because it's a list box. I'll put a label on the form to go with it so that the user knows what the list box is for. And I'm going to include some occupations in the list box that the user can choose from. First of all, make sure that the list box is actually selected. And then use the items property. There's a little button here which will allow me to add a collection of items. Click OK and I now have a populated list box. Let's capture the user's selection. I need a variable to store it in. And I can capture the user's selection in a slightly different way. I'm using the selected item property. Let's try it out. Hello, Kevin Drum. You are a male teacher. I can also add items to the list box programmatically. In other words, in my code. I'll quickly show you this and then you can experiment with it yourself. You might remember in an earlier video, I showed you how you could write code when the form loads. I'm going into the form design environment and I'll double click the form itself. I now have a procedure called form one load. Any code I write here will run immediately after I start the application, but before the form appears on the screen. And I'm going to add some extra code to put a few more items into my list box. I am adding something to the collection of items which are inside that list box. I'm just going to make sure that the list box is big enough to display everything. And let's give it a try. Hello Beatrix Potter, you are a female writer. Before we look at some more code, I want to introduce you to some of the facilities that come with Visual Studio for debugging your code. In other words, tracking down errors in the code. The first and probably most useful one that I want to talk about is being able to set a breakpoint and then step through the code. I can set a breakpoint by clicking on the gray bar here. That's a breakpoint. 
Now I'm going to run the program. Watch what happens. I'm now in what's called break mode or debugging mode. My application ran at full speed until it came to the breakpoint and now it's suspended and I can step through the code one line at a time. There are a number of buttons I can use to do this up here. Step into, step over, step out. I'll say more about these two later. The most useful one is step into. Notice I can also use the function key F8 to do the same thing. So when I click the button, I'm getting a message about how the stepping facility will behave. I'm not too worried about this for now. I'm just going to say I don't want to see these messages again. It's highlighting the line of code that it's about to execute next. And now it's about to execute this line of code. And again, it's about to execute this line of code. When I'm in debug mode, I can hover over the name of a variable to see its contents. So I can see that the string mail has been assigned to this variable. Drum has gone into this one, and Kevin has gone into that one. If I take a look at this variable, it hasn't been assigned a value yet, because this line hasn't executed yet. Let's continue stepping. And I can see there's something inside that variable now. The final line of code in this procedure will do some output. So I've been switched back to the user interface. And finally, the procedure will come to an end. My application is still running, the form is still on the screen. But the procedure which I launched when I clicked on the button has now finished. I can use as few or as many breakpoints as I like. I'm going to remove this breakpoint just by clicking on it again and I'll place a breakpoint here instead. I'm also going to place a breakpoint on the form's load event handler. Let's run it again. Now, as I told you in the previous video, when you launch a Windows Forms application, the form is loaded into memory before it hits the screen. So the form's load event handler is running first. I'll step through that and it's populating the list box. When that's complete, the form can hit the screen. And clicking the button causes the button's click event handler to start running. And we've seen this before. When we're in debug mode, there's some extra windows that you might want to switch on. A particularly useful one is called the Locals window. You can find it here. On the Debug menu. Debug, Windows, Locals. What it's showing me is the contents of any local variables. In other words, variables which have been declared within this procedure. I'll say more about the difference between local and global variables later on. Suffice to say for now, this is an alternative way of finding out what's inside a variable. I can see a nice summary down here. There's additional information in this window as well, which pertains to these parameters which I mentioned in another video. We'll say more about these later. With the locals window, I can actually change the contents of a variable on the fly, as it were. I just double click it here and retype it. I've overwritten the existing value of that variable. If you've finished stepping through your program, you can stop the execution just by clicking on this red square. Or you can press continue and it will jump you straight to the next breakpoint, if there is one. At this point, I just want to return to a type of error that you've seen already, and that's the so-called syntax error. 
For example, if I misspell the word text, I type tex on the end. I've got a red wavy line. If I open a bracket but forget to close it, again, that's a syntax error. I can see a red wavy line on the end of this. Keep an eye out for these because your program won't run properly if you don't fix them. I like to fix them as I go along, but let's see what happens when I try to run a program which has got syntax errors like this in it. There were build errors, would you like to continue and run the last successful build? Well that begs the question, what does it mean by build? So let's say no, and I'm going to switch on something called the output window. Watch what happens when I try to run the program again. Build 0 succeeded, 1 failed. This tells us something very important about VB.NET programs. When you write a program, you're writing source code, code that a human being can understand. But before you can run a program, it has to be compiled. What that means is it has to be turned into machine code, binary ones and zeros, that the computer can understand. When you press the start button, Visual Studio will automatically try to compile the program first. Another name for compiling a program, or compilation, is to build the program. So you can see here the program has failed to compile, the build failed, and I'm very kindly being asked would I like to use the last successful build? Would I like to run the version of the program that compiled successfully previously? Well, in this case, the answer is no. I want to fix this version of the program, so I'm going to click on no, and now I have a list of errors. This is really just a summary of the same information that I saw with the red wavy lines. I'm being told that it's expecting a closing bracket. A double click on there, and it jumps me to where I need to do the fix. And I'm being told that TEX is not a member of text box. In other words, TEX is not a property of a text box. A double click and it will jump me straight to that line. I can fix it here now. As I said before though, I like to watch out for the red wavy lines while I'm coding and fix them as I go along. I'll show you some more debugging facilities as and when I need them in later videos. In this video, I'm going to talk about how we can work with numeric input from the user. In other words, how we can do calculations with number data. Before I do, I'm going to build myself a simple little interface with a couple of text boxes and a button. Notice how I've been naming the controls as I go along. This will make the code easier to understand. The first thing I'd like to do is add together two numbers that the user types onto the form. So I'll start by declaring a couple of variables. Remember, the data type integer means a whole number. I'm going to declare another variable to store the results of the calculation. And now I'm going to capture the data that the user types into those text boxes. Adding these together couldn't be simpler. I result equals I number one plus I number two. Let's output the result and see if it works. Twelve plus five is seventeen. Let's try something else. 
let's subtract one number from the other. I result equals I number one minus I number two. I'll just borrow that message box statement and we'll run the program again. So that's the two numbers added together. And that's what we get when we subtract 5 from 12. What about multiplication? To multiply two numbers together, we use an asterisk. That's the multiplication symbol when you're programming. 12 plus 5 is 17. 12 minus 5 is 7, and 12 times 5 is 60. Bit of copying and pasting to speed things up. To divide one number by another, use a forward slash. So this reads as i number 1 divided by i number 2. 12 plus 5 is 17, 12 minus 5 is 7, 12 times 5 is 60, and 12 divided by 5 is 2. Well, not quite, but remember we're working with integers here. We're working with whole numbers. When I divide one integer by another and store the result in an integer variable, VB is automatically going to round the result either up or down. Let's improve on this. Instead of using integer variables, I'm going to use a real number type. Let's use a double. I'm also going to change the naming I've used here. DBL for a double. Strictly speaking, it doesn't matter what I call these variables, but I want the names to be meaningful, and I want the names to reflect the data type. Let's see what we get this time. Same as before, 12 plus 5 is 17, 12 minus 5 is 7, 12 times 5 is 60, but 12 divided by 5 is 2.4. That makes more sense. Just to be clear about the way a variable works, I'm multiplying two numbers together here, and I'm storing the result in this variable called dbl result. When I perform a second calculation, I'm storing the result in the same variable. What's happening is I'm overwriting the existing value in dbl result. I lose the value which was generated by the first calculation. When I do the third calculation, I overwrite the value inside dbl result again, so I lose the result of the second calculation. By the time my program comes to an end, this contains the result of the first number divided by the second number. If I wanted to keep the result of each of these calculations, then I should have declared four separate variables. These are called arithmetic operators. These are the basic operations that we might want to perform with numbers. There are a couple more. Let me show you them. That's the caray symbol, which is normally above the number 6 on your keyboard. And what it means is raised to the power of. So it's going to raise number 1 to the power of number 2. 12 plus 5, 12 minus 5, 12 times 5, 12 divided by 5, and 12 to the power of 5. That's 12 times 12 times 12 times 12 times 12. Another useful operator is integer division. I'm going to use a backslash instead of a forward slash. In some programming languages, you would use the word div. In fact, the pseudocode that you see on most exam papers will use the word div. In Visual Basic, we use a backslash. Let's take a look. That's the effect of using a backslash instead of a forward slash. 12 is being divided by 5, but only the whole number part of the result is being kept. 12 divided by 5 is 2, 
with two remainder. We're ignoring the remainder. Let's try 15 and 4. 15 plus 4 is 19. 15 minus 4 is 11. 15 times 4 is 60. 15 divided by 4 is 3.75. That's 15 raised to the power of 4. And that's 15 divided by 4, ignoring the remainder. 4 goes into 15 three times. The last arithmetic operator that I'd like to show you now is mod. Number 1, mod number 2. Mod is the remainder after whole number division. Let's see what this does. Let's go with 24 and 9 this time. I'll just move the form across so you can see the code as well. 24 plus 9 is 33. 24 minus 9 is 15. 24 multiplied by 9 is 216. 24 divided by 9 is 2.6 recurring. The number of decimal places you can see there is governed by the data type. 24 raised to the power of 9 is this rather large number. 24 divided by 9 using integer division is 2. 9 goes into 24 twice. And 9 goes into 24 twice with 6 remaining. That's what mod is giving me. It's the remainder after whole number division. Let me finish with a word of warning. I'm going to run this program again, but I'm not going to enter any data. I'm going to leave these two text boxes empty. Straight away, I have an error message. Conversion from string to type double is not valid. This tells me something about what's going on behind the scenes. Let's stop the program and put a breakpoint on this line. When you type something into a text box, it's actually a string. Notice here, text equals 57 in double quotes. When this line of code executes, VB will automatically convert the string 57 into a number. You can see DBL number 1 has got a zero in it at the moment. That's the initial value of any numeric variable until you assign something else to it. Step through the code. The text box contained 57, but the variable contains 57. Behind the scenes, Visual Basic is automatically converting the string into a double, because it can. But notice that my second text box contains a zero length string, a pair of double quotes with nothing in between them. It's a string, but it just doesn't have any length. And when this line of code executes, VB will attempt to convert that zero length string into a number, but of course it can't. And my program has crashed. This is what we call a runtime error. The program crashed while it was running. It crashed at runtime. Another name for a runtime error is an exception. So you can see here I have an unhandled exception. I'll talk more about runtime error handling or exception handling in a later video. But for now, with this program, we just have to expect the user to do the right thing, not to leave any of the text boxes blank. In this video, I'll say something about complex arithmetic, that is, arithmetic expressions that contain more than one arithmetic operator. Let's write some code. Let's imagine we're building an application for a cake shop, and the application will calculate the total cost of a number of cakes. 
I'm not going to capture any input, I'm just going to hard code the data to keep things simple. So I've declared three variables, one for the price of a cake, one for the quantity of cakes, and one to store the total cost of however many cakes are being bought. Let's initialize these variables with some data. As I said, I'm hard coding the data so I can focus on the calculations, but of course I would probably want to capture this data from text boxes on the form. So to calculate the total cost of 10 cakes at a price of £5 per cake, these are good cakes by the way, I'll use the multiplication operator. And let's output the result. £50 worth of cakes, no surprises there. Now suppose for a moment we want to calculate a discount of let's say £2 per cake. you might be tempted to try this. Take the original price, subtract the discount and multiply it by the quantity. £5 per cake minus £2 per cake, that's £3 per cake, multiplied by 10. I might expect a result of £30. Let's take a look. Minus £15. Not only are we giving the cakes away, we're giving money to the customers as well. That's totally unsatisfactory. What's going on? Well, there's an order of operations that applies when it comes to complex arithmetic expressions. By a complex arithmetic expression, I simply mean an expression with more than one operator. This expression includes a minus sign and a multiply sign. The order of priority is that multiplication is done first. So in this case, the discount is being multiplied by the quantity, which is 20, and then that is being subtracted from the price. 5 minus 20 is indeed minus 15. If I want the discount to be applied first, in other words, I want the subtraction to happen first, I can control it using brackets or parentheses, as they're otherwise known like this. So now anything inside the brackets will happen first. And there's the £30 I was expecting. You may well have come across this already. You might have heard of bod mass. BOD mass stands for brackets, order, division, multiplication, addition and subtraction. That's the order of priority of the arithmetic operators. Order, by the way, means exponentiation, raising something to the power of something else. So what we're saying is anything inside brackets will be done first. If there's an exponentiation operator in the expression, that will happen next, followed by division, multiplication, addition and subtraction. The truth is division and multiplication have the same priority. Also addition and subtraction have the same priority. So perhaps we should say to indicate the fact. By the way, I typed a single apostrophe before I wrote this. This is not code, this is simply a comment which I've added to my code. Comments aren't executed, they're not part of the program. A comment is just something that I can put in my code to help me to understand it. Now let's suppose for a moment I want to add a charge for postage and packaging to the total cost of this order. will have a flat charge of £3. And I'm just going to add it to the end of this calculation. Thinking about the order of operations, whatever's in brackets will happen first, then that will be multiplied by the quantity, 
and then finally the postage will be added on. So I don't actually need to include any brackets here. £33 as expected. But there's nothing to stop you from adding brackets if it helps you to understand the code. So for example I might do this. I'm saying do all of this first and then add the postage at the end. Something else you may have come across is this. PEMDAS. This stands for... It's essentially the same thing as BODMAS. You might have noticed that the M and the D are the other way around. But that just makes the point that the order of operations when it comes to division and multiplication is irrelevant. Now beware, you might come across this. That's the cost of my cakes. That's 10 minus 5 plus 2. Of course, 10 minus 5 is 5, plus 2 is 7. That is 10 plus 2 minus 5. 10 plus 2 is 12, minus 5 is also 7. All I've actually done is swap around the order of the operations. But 10 minus 2 plus 5 is 13. Let's be clear, I haven't just swapped around the order of the operations, I'm changing the number which I'm subtracting from 10. 10 minus 2 is 8, plus 5 is 13. It's a different calculation. The same applies here. In the first two examples, all I've done is change the order of operations. I've got 10 divided by 5 times 2, or 2 times 10 divided by 5. But in the third example, it's a different calculation. It's 5 divided by 2 multiplied by 10. So beware, BODMAS and PEMDAS both apply. They do tell us the order of operations when it comes to complex calculations, but complex calculations can also be quite deceptive. There are three fundamental constructs in most high-level procedural programming languages such as VB.NET and they are sequence, selection and iteration. In this video I'm going to introduce selection. That means executing one block of code or another depending on the outcome of a test. One way we can do this is using the IF statement. Let's start with a simple user interface. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Get in the habit of naming your form controls as you place them on the form. I'm going to ask the user what country they come from and then give them an appropriate greeting. I'll capture the input from the form by assigning it to a variable. And now I'm going to use an if statement to test the contents of that variable. If the country is equal to Australia then I'm going to output the message G'day mate. I want you to notice that I'm using the equal sign to check if two things are equal. Whereas here I'm using the equal sign to assign something to a variable. In some programming languages you'll use a slightly different approach. For example in Python if you were checking for equality you would use two equal signs. In VB 
a single equal sign can be used either for checking or for assignment. So let's try it out. If I input Australia, I get the Australian greeting. If I input something else, nothing at all. That doesn't mean my code isn't working, it's doing exactly what it's supposed to do. This is what we call a one-line if statement. I can execute one command depending on the outcome of the test. But if I want to execute multiple commands depending on the outcome of a test, I'm going to use a block if statement. I've moved that command to the next line down. Visual Studio has automatically added an end if. And now between the if and the end if, I can have as many commands as I like. So watch what happens now. G'day mate. Good on ya. No worries. If I don't type Australia, if I type something else, nothing happens at all. Now a word of warning, if I put something after the word then, that's a syntax error. End if must be preceded by a matching if. This line of code is complete, it's syntactically correct. However, you can't have an end if on its own. If you're going to use a block if, there should be nothing after the word then. If there's nothing after the word then, and I forget to use end if, again, I've got a syntax error. If must end with a matching end if. So you have a choice. You can either use a block if or a one line if, but whichever one you use, you have to use it correctly. When it comes to a block if, I can have multiple else if clauses as part of it, like this. Else if country equals France, bonjour, comment allez-vous? Let's try it out. Those are my three Australian greetings. And if the country is France, bonjour, comment allez-vous? However, if I enter something which isn't France and isn't Australia, nothing. Let's include another else if. Else if country equals Japan, konnichiwa, chausi wadu desuka. I think I pronounced that correctly. Let's try it out now. And there are my Japanese messages. I can have as many else if clauses as I like in a block if statement. And I can finish with a single else clause. If I don't type Australia, France or Japan, then it will say, hello there, I hope you are well. So everybody gets something. Now, just a small word of warning, the tests that you perform with an if statement are case sensitive. Watch what happens if I type Australia in lower case. The block of code in the else clause is executing because I didn't use a capital A. I can remove the case sensitivity of this test by converting the contents of the variable st country into uppercase, like this. I'm saying take the content of st country, convert it to uppercase, and then put the uppercase version of it back into the variable, 
overwriting the original contents of that variable. And now I'm going to check to see if that is equal to this. It doesn't matter what type of case I use when I'm typing in the country, I've removed the case sensitivity from the test. Let's just step through this to be sure what's going on. I'll put a breakpoint on the procedure. So I've typed in lowercase Australia. That's what I've captured into this variable. And then I've converted it to uppercase Australia. So I'm asking if uppercase Australia is equal to uppercase Australia. And notice how execution has passed to the end of the if block. Because the Australian greetings have been displayed, there's no need to perform these other tests. One final thing to say, I've converted the user's input into uppercase and I might not want to leave it in uppercase. Notice this. Once the if block has completed, any code which comes after it then executes, for example this message box statement, but notice that ST country now contains uppercase Japan. I might want to leave it the way it was when it was input by the user. So rather than doing this, which replaces the existing contents of the variable, I'm going to do this. The content of the variable is only being converted to uppercase for the purpose of the test but I'm not reassigning the uppercase text back into the variable. I'm converting the text to uppercase on the fly, as it were. Watch what happens now. By the time we get to the end of the program, the contents of the variable are still in their original state. You might like to try writing a similar program yourself. Have a single if block with lots of else if clauses to greet people from different countries. In the previous video of this series, I showed you how to use an if block to execute a block of code conditionally. In other words, to decide whether or not to execute a block of code. The if block allows you to use one of the three constructs of high-level programming languages, namely selection. In this video, I want to say more about the if block and the kind of tests that we can perform with an if block. I've already created a new Windows Forms application and I've put three controls on the form. I have a label, a text box and a button. Notice that I've named the text box TXT exam score and I've named the button BTN get grade. The idea is that the user of this application will type in an exam score and then the program will calculate the grade. Let's write the code and see how we can use logical operators to build complex conditions. I'll start by capturing the score into a variable. I'm assigning the contents of the text box to an integer variable called iScore. Now the first thing I want to do is check whether it's a valid score. Let's suppose that you can only score between 0 and 100 on this test. There's a few things to notice here. I'm asking if the score is less than zero. This is the less than symbol. 
And let me be clear, less than zero means minus one, minus two, minus three. Zero is not actually less than zero. Zero is equal to zero. I'm also checking to see if the score is bigger than 100. Given that you can't score more than 100 on this particular exam, anything bigger than 100 would be invalid. If the score is less than zero, or the score is greater than 100, then we'll display a message saying this is not a valid score. I'm also giving the user of my application some guidance. I'm not just telling them what they did was wrong, I'm telling them what they should do instead, which is good practice for an error message. Then notice I'm exiting the program. I've put another line of code here just to prove the point. When we drop out of the if block, normally this line of code would be executed. But because I've said exit sub, this will force the program to stop there and then. Let's give it a try. If I type a score of, let's say, minus one, this is not a valid score. I'm getting the error message. Let's try a score of 101. Again, not a valid score. Let's try a score of 99. And I want you to notice that we've dropped out of the if block and we're getting that message at the end of the program saying all done. It hasn't actually done anything yet. We'll deal with that in a moment. Just to be sure, I should really test the value zero. Zero is valid. Zero is a perfectly good value. And I should also test the value 100. And that's fine as well. So that's the beginning of my exam checker program. And I'm using something called a logical operator. The word or is one of three logical operators which you'll come across. The less than symbol and the greater than symbol are called relational operators. That is the condition clause of my if statement. And because it's effectively performing more than one test, we call it a complex condition. Now, before I try and work out what the grade for a particular score is, I'm going to keep it really simple and just test to see whether somebody has passed or failed. So, if the score is bigger than or equal to 50, it's a pass. If the score is less than 50, it's a fail. Notice the greater than or equal to symbol. That's another relational operator. Let's give it a whirl. A score of 45 is a fail. And notice all done is being displayed unconditionally. That's going to happen one way or the other. A score of 55 is a pass. Now it's good practice when you're testing a program like this to try all of the boundary values. And by boundary values, I mean 50 is a boundary, 100 is a boundary, zero is a boundary. So let's try a score of 50. 50 is a pass. It's also a good idea to test parts of the program that we've already tested. Because when you add new code, you might introduce bugs. So I'm going to test less than zero again. Minus five is not valid. And neither is 105. It seems to be working. Now you might have already noticed that I've used three separate if blocks. In the previous video, I showed you one if block with multiple else if clauses, and I'd like to point out the difference between the two. I'm going to set a breakpoint on this program and run it up again, and we'll put in a failing score. Let's say 30, and now I'll step through the code. So we assign the contents of the text box to the variable. We check to see if the contents of the variable are within range, in this case they are, so we jump to the end of this if block. 
Then we check to see if the score is greater than or equal to 50, which it isn't. So we jump to the end of this if block, and then finally we check to see if the score is less than 50, which it is, and we report that it's a fail. All done. Let's do that again, but this time I'm going to put in a passing score. Let's say 75. Assign the content of the text box to the variable. Check that it's in range, which of course it is, so we jump to the end of the first if block. Check to see if the score is bigger than or equal to 50, which it is. Report that it's a pass. And now we're checking to see if the score is less than 50, which of course is unnecessary. We're doing a test that we don't need to do. We've already established that it's a pass. To make my program more efficient, I'm going to use a single if block with multiple else ifs. My validation test where I checked to see that the score was actually within range, I could have left as a completely separate if block. But don't forget, there was an exit sub in there, and it may well be that there's some code I want to execute unconditionally at the bottom of the program. If you use exit sub early on, that won't happen. So I've included this as well inside the if block with multiple else ifs. Let's give it a go. A score of 67 is a pass, all done. Let's step through it and watch what's happening. The score is in range. The score is bigger than or equal to 50, so we report a pass. And then we drop out of the if block. We don't need to do any more tests. So although it's perfectly reasonable to have multiple if blocks, each performing a separate test, it may be better to use a single if block with multiple else ifs, and then the program doesn't have to work as hard. Now admittedly, with a little program like this, I'm not going to notice a lot of difference. But as you start writing longer, more complex programs, then small adjustments will add up and your program will run faster. OK. It's one thing writing a program that works efficiently, but it also has to be robust. We want a program that you can't crash, and I can crash this one easily. Watch. I'm typing text into the text box rather than a number. Invalid cast exception. Conversion from string 10 to type integer is not valid. This makes the point that when you type something into a text box, it's a string. There's the word 10 with double quotes around it. And I'm trying to put that string into a variable that's designed to hold integers, whole numbers. I'll run the program again with a breakpoint, but this time I'll be a well-behaved user. Notice that the text box contains the string 10. The text box does not contain a number. It's a string of characters. But because I'm trying to assign it to an integer variable, VB will attempt to convert it into an integer. And the string 10 can be converted into the number 10. So everything is fine. The program does not crash. The text 10 in double quotes has been converted into the number 10. Converting data from one type to another is called casting, and VB was able to do the cast. Let's run it again with something it can't handle. VB will attempt to convert the string FIVE into a number, and of course, that is an invalid cast. It can't do it. The last thing I want to do is give my program to a user who can inadvertently crash it. 
so let's add some extra code to get around this problem. Before I attempt to initialize the variable iScore with the contents of the text box, I'm going to test to see whether or not VB will be able to convert it into a number. Like this. Is numeric is a special built-in function which will allow me to test whether or not something can be converted into a number. In this case, I'm testing the contents of the text box. Let me be clear, it doesn't convert it into a number. It simply asks the question, can it be converted into a number? When I perform this test, the outcome will either be true if it can be converted or false if it can't. So I'm saying if is numeric, equals true, if it can be converted into a number, then I will do this line of code. I'm initialising the variable conditionally. If it can't be converted, then I give an appropriate error message, and I am exiting the programme this time, because there isn't much I can do with that data unless it is actually a number. So there's my little validation routine. Let's give it a go. Type in some text. You must enter a number. And I'm not getting the all done message because I've forced an exit from the program. Now there's one more thing I can do just to improve the efficiency of the program a little bit. And that's to tell VB that I want to convert the contents of the text box into an integer rather than allowing VB to make the decision for me. And I can do it like this. C int is short for convert to integer. And of course my program is only going to do this if it can. I've already made sure of that with my is numeric test. If I left this out, it would still work, but I'm leaving it up to VB to decide what to convert the contents of the text box into. An integer, a double, a single, and it will make that decision based on the variable's data type. I'm just taking the decision out of VB's hands and it will result in a very slight improvement in performance. I'll talk more about special inbuilt functions in another video, but you've seen two already, is numeric and C int. In the previous video, I showed you how to write this little routine to check if an exam score was a passing score or a failing score. I made use of one of three logical operators. I used the OR operator. In this video, I want to say a little bit about the other two logical operators, namely AND and NOT. I'll be adding more else if clauses to my if block to come up with a grade for a particular score rather than just pass or fail. In the previous video, I also paid particular attention to validating the user's input. You can see my program has an if block right at the start to check if the user's input can be converted into a number. And if it can, then it does. It converts it into an integer. I've explicitly performed the type conversion also known as a cast, using the cint function. If I hadn't used cint, then vb would have done the cast for me, if it could. If vb does it, it's known as implicit type conversion. Explicit type conversion is more efficient. Before we add some more logic to this program, I just want to point out that it's not perfectly robust yet. I can still crash this. Let me show you how. You've seen that if I type text, I've essentially trapped the error. But what if I put in a number which is too big? That is an extremely large number. And it's crashed my program. An integer variable occupies four bytes of memory, that is 32 bits. So the maximum number of values that you can store in an integer variable is 2 to the power 32. It works out to about 4 billion. Now since we also need to store negative integers, that means we can go from about minus 2 billion 
to positive 2 billion. The number I entered was bigger than 2 billion. And I've got what's known as an overflow exception. There's a possibility that the person who's using my program might type in a very large number and trigger this runtime error. This is a fairly easy one to sort out. I'm just going to change the user interface. Notice that my text box has a max length property. That's the maximum number of characters I can type into the text box. You can see it's over 32,000. I can type 32,767 characters into this text box. Well, my exam score is never going to be bigger than, let's say, 100. So if I limit the number of characters that you can type into the text box to, let's say, 3, then the maximum value you can put in there is 999. A simple fix. I can't enter a number bigger than three characters long. Now, let's add some more logic to the IF block. Depending on the score, I want to award a grade which is either A, B, C, D, E or F. I'm going to keep the test which checks to see if the data is within range, but I'll add some more ELSE IF clauses. If you score less than or equal to 20, that is a grade F. If you score more than 20 and less than or equal to 30, that is a grade E. Notice the use of the logical operator AND. What I'm saying is the score must be bigger than 20 and it must also be less than or equal to 30. A score between 31 and 40 will get you a D. And anything between 41 and 50 will call that a C. In this particular examination, anything between 51 and 70 will get you a B. Notice I've got a syntax error. There's a red wavy line. What's it telling me? Expression expected. Not particularly helpful. But this is actually quite a common mistake when you're writing complex expressions which include logical and relational operators. I need to include I score again right here. If I'm using a relational operator to compare two things, such as a variable and a number, then I have to say what two things I am comparing. I have to be explicit. OK, so every other score is going to get you a grade A, so I can just use an else clause now. And that is all of the possibilities taken care of. Now notice I've been very, very careful not to overlap the ranges of scores. This range is between 21 and 30, inclusive. This range is between 31 and 40, inclusive. There's no overlap. If, for example, I made this mistake, and I said greater than or equal to 30, then a score of 30 falls into this range and it falls into this range, then my program might not work. I might get some peculiar results. So just be very careful about that. If you think about what's going on here, a score of 30 is not covered either by this test or by this test. Think it through and you'll see that a score of 30 will actually get you a grade A. But that should be fine. There's one more logical operator which I haven't mentioned. And to be honest, I don't really need it in this scenario. But I can make use of it just to illustrate how it works. Instead of asking if the score is out of range, I'm going to just turn the logic of that question around and ask if the score is not in range.
In a sense, it's the same question. If the score is not in between 1 and 100, then it must be out of range. Now, all that remains is to test the program thoroughly. There are several possible execution paths, and I should really test them all. I should also make a point of testing things which I've tested before, for example my validation routine here. I need to make sure that I haven't introduced any bugs when I added new functionality. This is called regression testing. I should also check all of the boundary values. I should try a value of 0, a value of 100, a value of 20, 30, 40, 70. And I should also try valid values within the ranges which I've specified in my if statement, namely 25, 35, 45, 60, 75. If you don't test thoroughly and then you start adding more code to this, then you're building on shifting sand. Do it carefully now and you'll save yourself a lot more work later on. And straight away, I found a problem. It is possible to score zero on an exam. That should have been greater than or equal to zero. That's better. As I said, make sure that you test every possible pathway through the program. I'm going to show you an alternative to the if block, another way to perform selection in your code. I've created a new project. Let's pop a text box on there to capture some input and a button to run my program. The idea is that the user types in a temperature, maybe 15 degrees, and then the check temperature button will tell the user whether it's cold, freezing, warm, hot, that kind of thing. And although I could allow VB to do the implicit type conversion for me, I'm going to do it explicitly. Remember, a text box captures text input. I'm converting it into an integer. I'm not going to worry about my program crashing if the user doesn't behave themselves and type in a number. Now this is what the select case construct looks like. It begins with the word select, case, and then the name of the variable which I want to test, in this case I temperature, and it finishes with end select. And now I'm going to say in case I temperature is equal to zero, I will output the message freezing. If the temperature is less than zero, I'm going to output an appropriate message for that as well. If the temperature is between 1 and 10, that's cold. Notice the syntax, case 1, 2, 10. That means everything between 1 and 10 inclusive, so 1 and 10 are included as well. If it's between 11 and 20, it's warm. And let's say everything else is hot. And there it is, the select case construct. Now I could have done exactly the same thing using an if block, but arguably this is a little easier to read. It's somewhat easier to see what's going on. By the way, I could execute multiple lines of code as a result of each test. OK, it's a bit silly, but you get the point. I'm selecting one block of code or another, depending on the outcome of a test. Let's give it a try. Minus 5 is sub-zero. Zero is freezing, water will freeze, and you can go skating. Eight is cold, 
15 is warm and 200 is hot. You should really test all of the boundaries as well. So you should see what happens if you enter a 1 or a 10 or 11, 20 and then something incredibly big. This program can be crashed as well because we could type in some text. But of course we could add some additional logic to validate the data before the code gets into the select case block. By the way, there are some other things I can use in a case statement. For example, I could say case 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And that's an alternative to saying 1 to 10. So if it isn't a continuous range of values which I'm testing, that would be the way to go. And I can use all of my relational operators when I'm composing a test as well. So for example here, I've used a less than sign, but I could use greater than, I could use less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, not equal to. The same as if I was building a test for an if block. Now you might be wondering, why bother with an if block at all? Why not use select case every time? Well, there is a particular limitation when it comes to select case. You can only test one variable at a time. Let's say, for example, we've also captured the wind speed. I've just hard coded a value for the purpose of demonstration. I can't do something like this with a select case construct. I'm testing the contents of two variables using a logical operator. With a select case construct, I can only test one variable at a time. I could, however, nest an if block inside the select case construct, something like this. So, if the temperature is less than zero, we'll report that it is sub-zero, and then we'll check the wind speed. And if the wind speed is bigger than 20, we'll report that it's going to feel really cold. Perhaps you'd like to give it a try yourself. Maybe rewrite the exam grading program to use a select case construct instead of an if block. By the way, different programming languages might well have their own equivalent to the select case construct. C Sharp, for example, uses the switch construct, but it does pretty much the same thing. If you see pseudocode on an exam paper, it may well be written like this. I've commented it out because it won't work in Visual Basic, but you can see the concept is pretty much the same. I'm going to show you the third of the three fundamental constructs of high-level programming, namely iteration. Iteration means executing a block of code repeatedly. Iteration is also known as looping, and there are two ways you can do this in VB.net. One of them is with a for loop, and the other is with a do loop. In this video, I'm going to focus on the for loop. I've already created a new Windows Forms application and I've placed a button on the form. So let's get right into the code. To make something execute repeatedly, I need a way to count the number of repetitions. I need a way to count the number of iterations. So I'm going to declare a variable of type integer. It doesn't really matter what I call the variable. I've called it I count because I'm going to count my way through a loop. The for loop looks like this. Any code that I write between for and next will execute repeatedly. In this case, five times, because I'm counting from one to five. Let's begin with a simple message. Give it a try. Hello once, twice, three times, four times, five times. Now that was a single line of code, but let's put a couple more inside the loop. Try it again. Hello, how are you? Well, I hope. Once. 
Hello, how are you? Well, I hope. Twice. So, these three lines of code are executing in sequence five times. Let's take it back down to one line for now. I can display the value of iCount as part of the message, like this. Hello 1, hello 2, 3, 4, 5. Let's do something a little more interesting. My program will beep every time we pass through the loop. The beep command is very straightforward. Threading.thread.sleep means pause for three seconds. Something nice about a looping construct such as the for loop is I can change the number of iterations as easily as this. The code inside the loop will now execute 50 times. I can also change the step value like this. So I'm going to count up from 1 to 50, 5 at a time. Perhaps it makes more sense to count from zero. I can also count backwards. In this case, I'm counting from 50 to zero and I'm stepping minus five at a time. If I want to display the output in a single message box rather than separate message boxes, I could do something like this. Inside the loop, I'm not doing any output. I'm simply building the output string. I'm saying let st out equal whatever it used to be and then something else. In this case, the value of i count along with a new line operator. This time I only have one message box outside of the loop. And that's quite a common technique. So there it is, the for loop. In the next video we'll look at the do loop and then following that you'll see how the looping constructs really come into their own when working with array variables. Before we move on and look at another iteration construct, I thought it would be a good idea to get some practice in with what you've already learned. I've written a program here which makes use of an if block and a couple of for loops. I'll show you what it does first, then you can pause the video and try to write it yourself. When you're ready, you can look at my solution. My button has the text count up odd or even because that's what it does. Let's see. First I'm asked what number do you want to count up to? I'd like to count up to 10. Then I'm asked do you want odd numbers or even numbers? Notice I'm using an input box here. You've seen this in an earlier video. I want the even numbers. And my program comes back with 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. Let's run it again. What number do you want to count up to? I can choose any number I like. I'll go with 10 again. Odd or even numbers. Let's try the odd numbers this time. 1, 3, 5, 7, 
9. And that's it. Let's just give it one more try. Let's count up to 20. Odd or even, let's go with odd again. So that's the idea. If you want to try writing this program yourself, pause the video now and give it a go, and then you can resume the video when you're ready to see my solution. I should say, there's no one way to solve this problem. And here's my solution. I've declared a variable called imax, which is the number the program will count up to. It's an integer variable. I've declared a string variable called st odd or even, which will store odd or even depending on what the user types in. And then I have another variable called x, which will be my loop counter. It'll control passage through the count controlled loops. I start by asking the user, what number they would like to count up to. That value gets assigned to imax. Then I ask the user, do you want odd numbers or even numbers? And that gets assigned to st odd or even. I now have an if block where I'm testing the value of st odd or even. If the user typed in even, then we have a for loop which will count up in even numbers. Notice that I'm starting from 2 and counting up to imax, and I'm using the step clause to say that I want to step two at a time. So that's going to give me the even numbers up to the number that the user types in. Else, if st odd or even is equal to odd, then I have a for loop which starts at one, runs to imax, but also steps two at a time. So we start with one, then we add two, then we add two, and so on. As I said, this is just my solution. You might have come up with something slightly different. For example, you might have used two separate if statements, like this. And that's fine, because it will work. Having said that, using a single if block with an else if clause is a little bit more efficient, because this program will have to perform both tests. Did you get something similar? Did yours work? If not, why not try my approach? You previously saw how to make a line of code, or indeed a block of code, execute repeatedly using a for next loop, like this one here. I'm using a variable which I've named x to count my way through the loop. Let's just remind ourselves what it does. Personally, I tend to avoid using letters of the alphabet for variable names. I like the names to be a little bit more meaningful. So I'm going to rename x to something a little more appropriate. I've called it I count instead. I because it's an integer, and count because that's what it's for. It's to count my way through the loop. In this video, I want to show you an alternative way to make a line of code or a block of code execute repeatedly. I'm going to show you something called the do while loop. I'm referring to it as the do while loop because most people do, but as you'll see in a moment, it comes in a number of different forms. Here's one of them. Now you might be tempted to give this a try as it stands. I strongly recommend that whenever you're writing code that contains looping constructs, you should always save your code first. Watch what happens when I run this. Hello zero, hello zero. This will go on forever, just saying hello zero. Let's see if we can work out why. I need to stop the program. Fortunately, I can still see this red square here, so that will force the execution to stop. 
I've said that I want the loop to repeat while the value of I count is less than or equal to 5. Immediately after you've declared a numeric variable, it will contain 0. So by the time we get to this line of code, I count contains the value 0, which of course is less than or equal to 5. So we output hello 0. When the loop repeats, I count is still 0. Its value hasn't changed. So we output the message again. And then the loop repeats again, and again, and again. It's called an infinite loop. It will go on forever. Because I'm using a do while loop, I need to make sure that I write some code to increment the value of I count. I'm going to increment the value of I count before I do the output, like this. So all this line of code says is take the value of I count, add 1 to it, and then put the result back into I count, overwriting what's already there. In other words, add 1 to I count. So at the top of the loop, we check if the value of I count is less than or equal to 5, which first time around it is, it's equal to 0. Then we increment it, so now I count has the value 1. Then we do the output, hello 1. We go back to the top of the loop, and because I count is still less than or equal to 5, we get back into the loop code, and we add 1 to it. I count now has a value of 2, so we can output hello 2. And around and around we go until such time as I count is no longer less than or equal to 5. We've met the so-called exit condition of the loop. So we can exit the loop, and the program will continue down here. Let's just put a line of code in here just to prove that the program has dropped out of the loop. Now let's give it a go. Hello 1, 2, 3. 4, 5, 6, we'll have to look at that and think about why that's happening, and then all done. I only wanted to count up to 5, but it actually counted up to 6, and that has to do with the exit condition of my loop. I said I want to loop while I count is less than or equal to 5, which means my loop will continue if I count is equal to 5. When I count is equal to 5, I add 1 to it, so it becomes 6, and I do another output. All I need to change is that exit condition. Do while I count is less than 5. That's better. You need to be mindful of the contents of the variable which you are using to count your way through the loop. Now you might be wondering, why do we bother with do while loops when we have for next loops? I've had to write more code to get the same effect. Well, the answer to that question is that the do while loop is more flexible. For example, I can say do until I count is equal to 5. Strictly speaking, this is not a do while loop, this is a do until loop. Watch what happens when I run it. Exactly the same effect. But it means that I can build an alternative exit condition for a loop. And as you'll see later, sometimes it's more appropriate to use do until rather than do while. I can also do this. I'm just going to move this piece of code. So I'm saying do this block of code and loop until I count is equal to 5. Let's take a look. Exactly the same effect. But sometimes it's appropriate to put the exit condition at the bottom of the loop. This means that the code inside the loop will execute at least once. If the exit condition is at the top of the loop, it might not execute at all. If, for example, something has set the value of I count to be equal to 5 before we go into the loop, like this, 
then the code inside the loop won't execute at all. We've already met the exit condition. And there's one more form of the do while loop, if I may call it that, which I'd like to show you. Loop while I count is less than five. Does the same thing. Let's look at those four variations next to each other so we can compare them. Four loops that do exactly the same thing. Now we need to be careful here. I need to reinitialize the value of I count in between each of these loops. It starts off here with a value of zero. But by the time we've dropped out of the first loop, it will have a value of 5. As I said, you need to be mindful of the value inside the variable which you are using to count your way through the loop. For good practice, I'm going to explicitly initialize it here as well. Although I know in this particular program it will have a value of 0 at that point. So there you have it, four different variations of the do while loop, or the do until loop if you'd rather call it that. I'm going to show you a useful application of a do while loop. I want the user to enter a number and only a number. A do loop can be used to repeatedly prompt the user if the data is invalid. I'm also going to show you why a do loop is called a condition controlled loop. You might remember that a for next loop is called a count controlled loop. Let's write some code. Let me show you something which might strike you as rather silly, but it makes a very important point. I'm using an input box function to prompt the user to type in their name. But the name must be Kevin. So I've placed this instruction inside a do while loop. And look at my exit condition. Do while st name is not equal to Kevin. When we drop out of the loop, I simply output the name that was entered. Let's give it a try. I'll try John. That's no good. Ben? Nope. Enzo? Anything I type is invalid unless it's Kevin. You can see why this is called a condition controlled loop rather than a count controlled loop. I'm not incrementing a variable to determine how many times I pass through the loop. There's no loop counter involved. Let me show you another approach. Do while true equals true. I could have just as easily said do while one is equal to one. That might strike you as a rather ridiculous exit condition because one always equals one. Essentially what I've written here is an infinite loop. True equals true is more typical in fact, I can just say do while true. It means exactly the same thing. But if I have an infinite loop, well, how do I get out of it? I can do this. I capture the input, test it to see if it's what I'm looking for, and if it is, then I force an exit from the do loop by using the command exit do. Once again, you can see that I'm not counting my way through the loop, I'm exiting the loop in a different way. So how is all of this useful? Well, as I said, I want to write a program to prompt the user to enter a number and only a number. Take a look at this.
I've declared two variables, one called st age, because I want to capture the user's age, but notice I've declared it as a string. And then I've declared another variable called i age, which is an integer. I'm prompting the user to enter their age, and I'm assigning the value to st age. This is a temporary measure so that I can test st age. And look at my exit condition. Do while is numeric st age equals false. In other words, while whatever the user types in cannot be converted into a number. To understand this, you need to appreciate that the input box function always captures a string. So, for example, if I'm prompted to type a number and I type, let's say, 59, I'm actually typing the string 59. If I attempt to assign that string to a numeric variable like i age, it'll be fine. Visual Basic will do something called implicit type conversion. It will automatically convert it into an integer because it can. For example, this line of code will be absolutely fine as long as the user types in a string that can be converted into an integer. If, however, when this line of code executes, the user types in a string like hello, it will crash the program because Visual Basic can't automatically convert that string into something we can save into an integer variable. I'm trying to prevent my program crashing for that reason. So instead, I'm asking the user to type in their age, but I'm storing it into a string variable. It doesn't matter what they type, when we assign it to a string variable, it'll work. But because I want a number, I keep asking the user to type something until such time as I can convert it into a number. And that's what is numeric is telling me, whether or not a variable's contents can be converted into a number. I could ask the same question in a slightly different way, like this for example. Do while is numeric is not equal to true. It means the same thing as do while is numeric equals false. I can even ask the question like this. Do while not is numeric. It's the same exit condition, just phrased in a different way. I'm using a logical operator this time instead of a relational operator. It really is a case of take your pick. So we are repeatedly prompting the user to type in something we can convert into a number, and when the user finally types in something that we can convert into a number, we do so. I'm using one of the type conversion functions this time, cint. That's short for convert to integer. So I'm converting this string into an integer, and I know that this line of code is not going to crash because we wouldn't have got this far in the program unless the user typed in something that I could convert. This is called explicit type conversion. It's also called casting, when we change the data from one data type to another. Let's give it a try. I'll start with some text. That's invalid, so I'm being prompted again. Let's try some different text. Again, I didn't type something which can be converted into a number, so the loop continues. Let's try typing nothing at all. I'll just click OK. Well, that's no good either, because that's what we call a zero-length string. Think of a pair of quotes with nothing in between. If I press the cancel button, again, that's invalid. I can't get out of this until I type something that can be converted into a number. Remember, that might look like 123, but it's actually the string 123. But it's a string that can be converted into a number. So we drop out of the loop, convert the input into a number, store it in IH, and then display it in a message box. So there you go, a condition-controlled do-while loop, which I'm using to capture input and validate it at the same time.
In this video, I'm going to talk about array variables. As you'll see, array variables are particularly useful when you want to store a large number of related data items. In fact, once you've learned about array variables, you'll be able to write some very, very useful programs. Before I begin, let's quickly review what's going on inside the computer's memory when we use regular variables. When this line of code executes, the operating system will set aside a piece of memory and it will give it the name stfruit. The exact location of this piece of memory is entirely up to the operating system. It doesn't really concern us as programmers. But suffice to say, no other program can use that piece of memory. It belongs to this program. Immediately after a string variable has been declared, it will contain something. It contains a zero length string. Think of a pair of double quotes with nothing in between them. If you declare a numeric variable, for example an integer, then immediately after declaration it will contain the value 0. For the purposes of this discussion we don't really need to worry about this zero length string. When this line of code executes, I'm assigning a value to the variable. I'm putting the text banana in there. When I output the contents of a variable, it doesn't change the contents of the variable. We're simply taking a copy of what's in the variable and then displaying it on the screen. My variable still contains the text banana. This line of code will overwrite the existing contents of the variable. We're replacing the text banana with the text orange. The original contents of the variable are now lost. When this line of code executes, a separate piece of memory is being set aside. This time, the piece of memory is called stfruit2. No prizes for guessing what that's going to be storing. The exact location of this second variable, again, depends on the operating system. One of the main functions of the operating system, in my case Windows 10, is to manage the memory. This line of code assigns the string pineapple to stfruit2. When this line of code executes, a copy of the contents of stfruit are assigned to stfruit2. So orange overwrites pineapple. By the time we get to the final message box statement, both variables contain the same thing. Now, let's talk about array variables. Suppose that I want to store and process several different items of fruit. I could do it like this. I've declared five separate variables and I've initialized them individually. If I want to output the contents of one of those variables, that's straightforward enough as long as I know the name of the variable. That will output pineapple. But using regular variables like this to store a group of related data items is actually quite cumbersome. What if I wanted to store 10 items of fruit, or even 100 items of fruit, I'm going to end up with rather a lot of code. Instead of using five separate string variables, I'm going to use one array variable, like this. I've used quite a lot of copying and pasting to speed things up. I'm also going to change the name of this variable just to indicate that it is actually an array variable. I'm going to prefix the name with A.
A because it's an array, ST because it's an array of strings, and fruits because, well, that's what these are. You could actually call your array anything you like, but as you write more code you'll see the benefits of a naming convention. To understand what's going on here, again we should visualise what's going on inside the computer's memory. When I declare an array variable, like this, I'm actually saying that I want to set aside a group of memory locations. To be more precise, I'm setting aside a group of contiguous memory locations. Contiguous means adjacent, next to each other. The number 4 means that I want a group of 5 memory locations. It might strike you as odd, but in computer science we generally count from 0. We say that the array is 0 based. Each location in that group of memory locations is referred to as an element. So I have five elements, numbered from 0 to 4. When this line of code executes, I'm putting the text banana into element 0. This line of code puts orange into element 1, pineapple into element 2, strawberry into element 3, and mango goes into element number 4. I'm referring to each element by its index number. When I want to reference one of those data items, again I use the index number, so in this case I'm outputting the contents of AST Fruits 2, element number 2, pineapple. Let's give it a try. As expected. Let's output orange. I just have to change the 2 to a 1. If I want to output mango, I'll type a 4 here. I can also reference an element of an array less directly. Let's declare an integer variable. I'm just giving it the name i. I'm going to assign a value to that variable. And now I'm going to use the contents of i to reference an element of the array. Can you see what the program will output this time? i is equal to 3, so this reads as AST fruits 3. It will output strawberry. Indeed it does. Let's change the value of i to 0. Now I'm outputting banana. Banana is the zeroth element of the array. We can run into trouble though. Watch this. I'm setting the value of i to be equal to 8. My array variable only has 5 elements, numbered from 0 to 4. There is no element number 8. So what happens when I run the program now? Index out of range exception. My program has crashed. It's crashed because it can't find element number 8. There's no such thing. Let's reset the program. Now there's one more thing I would like to show you, which is where the real power of array variables comes in. I want to output each of those items in turn. So I am going to iterate through the array using a for next loop. Watch this. For i equals naught to 4, output AST fruits i. First time through the loop, i is equal to 0. So this will output banana. Second time through the loop, i will be equal to 1. So we output orange. Then i is incremented to 2 and we output pineapple, and so on until such time as i equals 4. Let's give it a try. And you can imagine, I can iterate through a hundred array elements just as easily as I can iterate through five. Give this a try yourself. Perhaps you can set up an array with 10 elements instead of 5.
In this video, I'm going to invite you to practice what you've already learned. There are eight exercises here involving array variables and loops, which you might like to try coding up yourself. I'll show you what they do, and then it's up to you if you want to give them a go. Alternatively, you can jump straight to my solutions later on in this video. By the way, all of these programs start with the same six lines of code. All of them declare an array variable of integers with five elements. And then the array is initialized, as you can see here. But it's important to realize that your programs have to work with any data, not just these. So let's see what they do. The first exercise is to output each item in a separate message box, one after another. Well, you've already seen how to do this in a previous video. I'm using a loop to scan through the array. Exercise 2. Output all of the items in the same message box, but on separate lines. Exercise 3 is to add up all of the items and output the total in a message box. They add up to 75. In exercise 4, we calculate the average of the items. The average value is 15. Very similar to exercise 3, except we're dividing the total by the number of items. In exercise 5, we are only adding up the items that are bigger than 20. There are two items in the array which are bigger than 20, namely 33 and 22, and they add up to 55. We're still doing this with a loop, but as we visit each item, we're deciding whether it's bigger than 20 or not. In exercise 6, this is a little bit trickier. You have to find the largest item and output it in a message box. The biggest item is 33. And let's be clear, the program is working out which is the biggest item. If you can do exercise 6, you'll find exercise 7 very easy. Exercise 7 is finding the smallest item. And exercise 8 is replacing each item in the array with a new value that is twice as big. And then we output those values in pretty much the same way as we did in exercise 2. So if you want to give them a try yourself, pause the video now and see what you can come up with. Alternatively, you can jump straight to the solutions. So let's take a look at my solutions. The objective of exercise 1 was to output each item in a separate message box one after another. You've seen how to do this in a previous video. I start by declaring an array of five integers, and then I initialize the array. In order to scan the array, I need a loop counter. So I've declared an integer variable called i, and that controls the number of passes through the for loop. Then I say for i equals naught to four, output ai data element number i. So first time through the loop, i is 0, that outputs the first item. Second time, i is 1, I output the second item. And so on, until i is equal to 4, we output the last item and we drop out of the loop. In exercise 2, we want to output all of the items in the same message box. So we don't have an output command within the loop, we're simply building a string. I've declared a string variable called stout, and inside the loop I say stout equals whatever it used to be plus the next item in the array. I'm also concatenating a new line operator on there as well, so the string actually contains the information needed to throw a new line between each item. When we drop out of the loop, we display the output string in one go. The solution to exercise 3 is similar to the solution to exercise 2. 
we want to calculate the total of the data items. So I've declared a variable called iTotal to contain this. And then as we visit each item in the loop, I say iTotal equals whatever it used to be plus the next item. I'm using the addition operator instead of the concatenation operator this time. When we drop out of the loop, I display the total in one message. The objective of exercise 4 was to calculate the average. Well, this is pretty much the same as the previous exercise. I calculate the total first, and then when I display the message, I simply divide the total by 5. With exercise 5, the objective was to add up all of the items bigger than 20. So in some ways it's similar to the previous program. I've declared a variable to hold the total, but look what's going on inside the for loop. I'm adding the next value to the total conditionally. I'm testing each value first to see if it's bigger than 20, and if it is, I add it to the total. If it isn't, well, I don't. If you think about it, adding up all of the items which are, let's say, smaller than 20 would require a very simple change. All I'd need to do is change this relational operator to a less than sign. In exercise 6, you were invited to write a program to find the largest item in the array. The principle behind this program is to visit each item in the array, and if it's bigger than the previous item, then keep a record of it. So I've declared a variable called iMax, which will hold the maximum value, and I've initialized it to zero, which pretty much guarantees that everything is going to be bigger than iMax to begin with, assuming I'm only working with positive numbers. When I visit the first item inside my loop, I ask, is it bigger than iMax? Well, of course, item 0, the number 5, is bigger than iMax. It's bigger than 0. So I'm assigning the first item to iMax, overwriting its previous value. iMax now contains a 5. 5 is the biggest item we've found so far. Second time through the loop, I examine the second item, and I ask, is it bigger than iMax? In this case, well, 7 is bigger than 5. So I replace 5 with 7. I'm keeping track of the biggest item. Third time through the loop, same question, and I replace 7 with 33. But fourth time through the loop, I find that 22 is not bigger than 33. So this line of code doesn't execute. By the time the program's finished, IMAX contains the biggest value. If you can solve exercise 6, then you can solve exercise 7 very, very easily. This time I have a variable called IMIN, which is going to hold the minimum value. And I'm initialising it with a very large value, something that I know is bigger than anything else in the array. I've made it 10,000. When I visit the first item, I ask, is it smaller than i min? Well, of course it is. 5 is smaller than 10,000. So i min becomes the first value. And then we proceed pretty much as we did in the previous program. By the time we drop out of the loop, we have the smallest value. The objective of exercise 8 was to replace each item in the array with a new value twice as big. I actually want to change the contents of the array, and that's what this loop does. It's actually very simple. I say let AI data, the item I'm looking at, be equal to itself multiplied by 2. So by the time we drop out of this loop, the array contains a completely different set of data. And then the remaining code simply outputs those data in a single message box, just like in exercise 2. Now, even if you didn't solve these problems yourself, it's well worth trying to duplicate the code that you can see here. It will definitely help you get a feel for using array variables with loops.
In this video, I'm going to show you how to implement a linear search. A linear search is one of many standard algorithms that you'll come across as a programmer. The principle of a linear search is to examine a list of items one at a time to see if it contains an item that we're looking for. I've already declared an array of 10 strings, and you can see I've initialized it with various items of fruit. By the way, you can see that the program contains the data that we're going to search. We say that the data has been hard-coded into the program. This is untypical. In reality, a program wouldn't normally have the data written into it like this. You'll see in later videos that a program can actually read the data in from an external file, perhaps a database, or a text file, or a spreadsheet, or even a web page. You'll also see how one program can call another and pass it some data to work with. For the purposes of demonstrating a linear search, hard coding the data like this is absolutely fine. We'll start by prompting the user for an item to search for. We'll call it the target value. So I've declared a variable to store it, and to keep things simple I'll use an input box to prompt the user. Now I'm going to use a loop to scan through the array, to visit each item one at a time. I'll need a loop counter. And I'm going to use a for loop. I could use a do loop, it's a matter of preference. A for loop will mean I can write slightly less code. As I visit each item, I'm going to check to see if it's the target value. I can do this with an if statement. Now this isn't the finished product, but it's well on the way. Let's see what happens. I'm getting a message for every item which is not the one I'm searching for. But I did get a message saying, it found it. Let's try it again. I'm looking for a star fruit this time. There is no star fruit in the list. Well, it's on the way but I don't want a message for every item which isn't the one I'm looking for. So let's improve it. Rather than doing some output inside the loop, I'm simply going to keep a record of whether or not I found it. And to do this, I'm going to use a Boolean variable. A Boolean variable can have one of two possible values, true or false. Immediately after it's been declared, it'll have a value of false. So, inside the loop, if I find what I'm looking for, I'm going to set be found to be equal to true. And I don't need an else clause, because if we don't find what we're looking for, be found will never get set to true, and when we exit the loop, be found will still be false. All that remains to be done now is to test be found once we get out of the loop to see if it's equal to true. Let's see what happens. We'll start by looking for something that we know is in the list. Found it. Just one message. Let's try again. We'll search for something else that we know is in the list. Yes, there's a fig. What about something that isn't in the list? Not found. Now just a couple of words of warning. When you're comparing strings in VB.NET, string comparisons are case sensitive. So for example, if I search for banana, with a small b, not found. 
However, banana with a large B is found. You've seen something similar to this in an earlier video. I can remove the case sensitivity of a string comparison like this. So I'm comparing the uppercase version of the target with the uppercase version of the array item. I can achieve exactly the same effect like this. L case means lowercase, so I'm comparing the lowercase version of the target with the lowercase version of the item in the array. And it's probably worth mentioning this as well. I can use dot to upper instead of U case. Now there's one more improvement I can make to the efficiency of my program. If I find what I'm looking for, there's no point in examining all of the other items in the array. If B found gets set to true, then we can force an exit from the for loop. For example, if we're searching for apple and we set B found to true, there's no point in looking at all of the other items in the array. We already know it's there. So there you have it, a standard linear search. If you're going to write code to create and manipulate a two-dimensional array variable, it's essential that you can visualize the data you're working with. Very often, a two-dimensional array variable is used to store groups of related data items, like the data you can see here. A two-dimensional array can therefore be thought of as a table. These are the data we're going to use in this video. Each row of the table contains the details of a different famous person. The first column contains their first names. The second contains their last names. The third column is gender. Then we have nationalities. And finally, their occupations, what it is each person is famous for. Notice that each column has an index number. Counting starts from zero, so the fifth column is column number four. Each row also has an index number, and these are also numbered from zero. It's useful to think of this table as having a horizontal dimension, which we'll refer to as the X dimension, and a vertical dimension, which we'll refer to as Y, just like the X and Y axes of a line chart. When you're coding up a two-dimensional array for a different set of data, I strongly recommend that you keep a sketch of it handy, like I'm going to do now. I can declare my two-dimensional array variable like this. I'm using a naming convention here. A, because it's an array variable, ST because it's an array of strings, and people because that's what the data is. In brackets, I've specified the X dimension first, followed by a comma, and then the Y dimension. And I've used the AS clause to specify that this is an array of strings. Now I'm keeping my sketch of the data handy while I populate this array. It's important to get this right. Otherwise, you might get some very peculiar behaviour when you run your program. I want to put Barrack in the first column and the first row. I want Obama in the second column and the first row. The third column, first row, contains male. And column number three, row number zero, contains American. It takes a little bit of getting used to counting from zero. And the final piece of data for this person is president. Now it's tempting to start copying and pasting, but I want to make sure I get this absolutely right. So I'm going to continue entering the values individually, just for now, 
working from my sketch. Let's get the New Zealand Prime Minister in next. As with the previous famous person, I've specified the column number first, followed by the row number. I've specified X, followed by Y. Notice that the value of X is different for each data item, but the value of Y is always the same, because Y is the row number. Let's do one more, very carefully, and then I'll speed things up with a bit of copying and pasting. And I've just realised that I've made a mistake. It's very easy to do. That's more like it. Now you could initialise each individual element of this array in any order you like, the important thing being that it's fully initialised. But taking a systematic approach like this will help to ensure, if not guarantee, you won't make any silly mistakes. A systematic approach will also help to ensure that all of the data gets in there. But I can see a pattern emerging now, so I'm going to start copying and pasting to speed things up a little bit. Now one last look at my sketch, just to make sure I've got everything there that should be there. And straight away I can see I need to change these twos to fives. And there it is, the code I need to declare and populate my two-dimensional array. So that's how we get data in. How do we get data out? It's actually very simple, if you've ever played a game like Battleships, With this message box statement, I'm going to output whatever is in column 4, row 3. In this case, the word scientist. What if I want to output, let's say, New Zealand? That's in column 3, row 1. Or perhaps the word Swiss. That's row 3, column 3. It's just a matter of supplying the appropriate coordinates. I can also supply these coordinates using variables. Now I could call these variables anything I like, but it makes perfect sense to call them X and Y. Can you see which data item will be output by this message box? Let's see. Now, just like a one-dimensional array, the real power of a two-dimensional array is realised when you combine it with looping constructs. Let's suppose I want to output all of the information about Barack Obama. Notice that with Barack Obama, it's the x-dimension which is changing from 0 to 4, but the y-dimension remains at 0. I can do this. In fact, I don't even need the variable y. Suppose instead I want to output the details of Mahatma Gandhi. Again, it's the x value which varies, but the y value stays the same. In this case, y remains at 4.
you should make sure that you're comfortable with this idea before you continue. Let's try Ada Lovelace. Ada Lovelace is in row number 2, so the value of y has to remain the same inside this loop. It has to be 2. Alternatively, I might decide that I want to display all of the values in a particular column. For example, I might want to display all of the last names. If we examine the data, we can see that every last name has the same value of x. Obama is 1, 0. Ardern is 1, 1. Lovelace, 1, 2. Einstein, 1, 3. Gandhi is 1, 4. And Van Gogh is 1, 5. It's the value of y which is changing this time. So I could write my loop like this. But notice that y varies from 0 to 5. So this time it's the value of x which is remaining the same inside the loop, but y is the value that changes. Perhaps I want to display all of the nationalities. Looking at the code, I can see that all of the nationalities have an x value of 3. Again, you should make sure that you're comfortable with doing this before you proceed. In the next video, I'll show you how we can get all of the data out using nested loops. In this video, I'm going to show you how you can systematically visit each and every item in a two-dimensional array. As in the previous video, I recommend that you keep a sketch of your data handy to help you visualise what's going on. Here's a sketch of the data I'm working with. You may, for example, want to display all of the data items one at a time, row by row, like this. The data are being visited one whole row at a time, but as each row is visited, every column in the row is visited. We say that the data in the array are being visited row-wise. Here's what the output of a program that does this looks like. Alternatively, you might want to visit the data column-wise, like this. A program that does this deals with one complete column at a time. But, as each column is visited, all of the rows in that column are visited. And here's what the output would look like. If you can systematically visit all of the data items in an array, one way or another, then you can collect the data into a single output string, then output everything at once, like this. Systematically visiting the data also allows you to search for something in particular. For example, you could ask the user for a surname and then find all the details of that person like this. So let's take a look at some code and see how this can be done. I'll begin by writing some code to display the data row-wise. I've already declared the array, and I've already initialised all of the elements of the array, just to speed things up. This is the same data which you saw in the previous video. I need two loop counters because I'm going to use nested for loops. If I want to visit one row at a time, I need a for loop like this. Because each row is numbered from 0 to 5. But while I'm visiting a particular row, I want to visit each column, and I can do it with a for loop like this. 
the columns are numbered from 0 to 4. Think of it this way. For each pass of the outer loop, there will be several passes of the inner loop. And now I'm going to output a data item for each pass of the inner loop. Let's see what happens when we run the program. Now let's display the data column-wise. I'm using a different button to run this program, but I'm going to copy and paste some code. It's the same code I used to declare and initialize the array. In a later video, I'll show you how two different procedures can share the same data. For now, we'll proceed like this. To visit the data column-wise, I'm going to use nested loops again. But this time, I'm going to scan the columns primarily. So I'm going to scan across the X dimension using my outer loop. And as I visit each column, I'm going to visit each row within that column. And I need another message box as before. Let's see how it looks this time. To display all of the data in a single message box, I need to decide whether I'm going to build the output string in a row-wise fashion or a column-wise fashion. I'm going to do it row-wise, so again I'm going to borrow some code. This is the code that displays the data items individually, but column-wise. I need a string variable to collect the data into. And then, rather than displaying a message box for each pass of the inner loop, I'm going to concatenate some new data to the output string. And between each data item, I'd like a space. Because I want each row of data to appear on a separate line within the message box, I'm going to concatenate a VB new line character onto the output string, but only with each pass of the outer loop. And once the nested loops have both finished, I can do one output with a single message box. Let's see if it works. The final thing I want to show you is how we can search for the details of a particular person based on their surname, for example. I don't actually need nested loops to do this. I'm going to use the same technique which I showed you in the previous video. Let's start by declaring and initialising the array. And I need some loop counters. And I'm going to use a Boolean variable to record whether or not I've found what I'm looking for. I'm going to initialize it as false, although to be honest I don't need to do that because immediately after it's been declared it will have a value of false. I just want my code to be explicit. I'll prompt the user for the target surname using an input box just to keep things simple, so I'm going to need a variable to hold the target value. I know that the surnames are in column number one, so I'm going to write a loop to scan down the rows of column number one only, testing each value as I go.
Notice how I've hard-coded the value of the x dimension here. I'm always looking at column number 1. As I scan down the column, if the data item which I'm looking at matches the target, then I'll set my Boolean variable to be equal to true, and I can force an exit from this for loop. By the time I've dropped out of the loop, I know whether or not I've found what I'm looking for. If I have, then I can retrieve the rest of the data for that particular person. Notice this time I'm scanning across the row. The value of y will be whatever it was when the first for loop came to an end, so I know this loop is looking at the correct row. If b found was equal to false, then we simply display a message saying that we can't find what the user was looking for. There's one final thing we need to add to this code. Let's see it in action. That seems to be working fine. And just to be sure, let's look for somebody who isn't in the array. That looks OK as well. Having said that, we have an additional message box here which is rather untidy. Let's put this right. That's better. You should try writing some of these programs yourself. Perhaps you could display the data column-wise but within the same message box, or maybe build a search facility where you enter the person's occupation to retrieve all of their details.